Do you, does anyone have questions? Um, you should ask them into the microphone, I think, for the sake of the recording. Um. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Hopefully one's a simple one and one's more complex. The simple one is when you're talking about the, the competitive issues and so on. Uh, it, it seems like right now everyone's trying to make a grab on being embedded into things. Roku TV, smart devices, and things like that. Where do you see Firefox playing in that world? Part of that is one of the big challenges for us in that space is having a, well, one of the parts of the Android components ecosystem is going to be an updater, right? An update management system. We would like to be able to help people build little, like, widget, little browser widgets for all kinds of different embedded things, not just the Fire Stick, but, you know, your set top cable box and so on, a uh, number of other things. One of the challenges we face there is that we really don't want to orphan people. Um, we really want to be able to say, not only can we, like, not only do we have a browser or a way for you to build a browser on your set-top box right now, um, but we also want to be able to help you build, like, okay, this is, this is the proxy box that you're going to sit in your server farm so that we can make sure that people using that product get updates in some kind of reasonable way. There's a lot of challenges there, um, particularly around, like, if you ever had to deliver meaningful software on constrained hardware and then update it. Um, one of the challenges there is like that often as not, people just don't think that updates are an acceptable cost. Um, and when you're talking about a device that, when you're talking about a device that takes arbitrary code from arbitrary places on the internet um, and then runs it as fast as it can, uh, security updates are really important. Um, so we're having to have a lot of early development and design and having a lot of interesting conversations with people about what constitutes an acceptable cost there and what we're willing to, to help them achieve. Uh, I, I sort of have fallen backwards into uh, doing some licensing work, uh, Mozilla licensing, which has started out being mostly about, you know, what does the MPL let me do? Uh, and has since turned into like, okay, well, you'd like to have a business conversation with us, I'll just direct you over to our business people. Um, and so the answer is, uh, it's early and we want to do a lot. We would like to take the time and care of doing it well and safely. Um, the safely part is important um, because we don't want to find out four years from now that we are responsible for a botnet because set-top boxes in this country didn't get, you know, the set-top boxes from this cable co in this location didn't get updates. Um, that sounds bad. Uh, and so we would like to avoid that. Sorry, that's probably a more long-winded, but it turns out that that's, I mean, that's not what you thought was the complicated question, but there's a complicated answer to that question. Okay. Um, uh, what's the I'm not question? sure what the complicated one is going to work out to. All right, hit me. Uh, as I'm listening to you talk, uh, it struck me that there was something in, that, that, that was a thread through which you were talking that seemed to have a stupid, simple answer to it, and I'm going to ask you to tell me why it's not stupid, simple. And that has to do with when you talk about, well, we, when we made it, we made it to be faster than Chrome. But I'm wondering if this day and age, fast isn't the criteria that's going to make it. And by that sense, I mean, when I choose, and I know other people that choose Firefox over Chrome or whatever, mm -hmm. they're not doing it because of speed. They're doing it because they don't want to be listened in on. Yeah. Everyone knows Chrome phones home. And every now and then you run into, okay, Google Plus had a break in ages ago, didn't tell anyone, and now they're closing Google Plus. These Chinese built chips into servers that are phoning home, and everyone is now scared to death of something phoning home to something. Not only that, but you have no idea what they're doing with it. Nobody knows Google's algorithms. Nobody knows what's happening to this stuff when it does. Mm -hmm. So forgive me for the rambling long question. Um, and then when, like, I use Focus, and I, I really like it. And part of me is wondering, sort of, it's this solution almost seems super simple to me in saying that Mozilla could be doubling down on the we don't want your data, we don't muck with your data. It's the same thing that DuckDuckDo uses to take on Google Search and saying, you come here, we are not going to screw with you. And and mm -hmm. that's a that's a compelling that's a compelling statement to make in saying in this world where you don't know what Facebook is doing with your stuff, you don't know what Google is doing with your stuff, mm -hmm. we throw it away. And then you went to another part of, the, of, of what you were saying where you're saying the user is in control. So when you talk about ad blockers, 
-hmm. So what's the logical things that you could go beyond ad blockers? One of the things comes to me to be VPNs. Well, if you're using ad blocker to subvert somebody's uh, idea of, of shoving ads in your face, well, a VPN subverts the intent to geo-block you from things. And it strikes me that this seems to be a road that could be already, to a certain extent, is very successful and might be the path that Firefox could double down on in saying, we are going to be the browser that we're as fast as everything else, if not faster, but we're not phoning home to anyone. And I'm just wondering if that sort of struck, I mean, to me, that is sort of the, the lightning moment where somebody say, you've got it already, right? Mm -hmm. you, allow, you allow plugins that say something that was intended to be streaming, if somebody wants to download it, there's a plugin for that. And there's mm -hmm. all sorts of things where you allow the user to be in control, not Google, not some third party, not somebody else phoning home. That point behind the user control of the interface, you're already there. And I'm almost wondering why you don't just double down on that rather than scrambling and saying where we should where should we be, where should we be? It seems like you're almost there. Why aren't you just doubling down on it? That's to me the super the stupid simple answer to this. So I'm asking you to tell me why it's not stupid simple. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, now the uh, the short answer is that there's, it's one of those things that is deceptively simple. Right. I mean, yes, this is part of what we've chosen. Yes, this is the, this is the brand promise of Mozilla is that security and respect for your data. But even in that context, well, not just respect for your data, respect for you and what you want to do with the web. The data is a big part of it, but not the only part. Uh, are we feeding back? Sorry. Um, the data is a big part of it, and. That was a lot of question, and I'm trying to, I guess the question you're asking is why is it we are not focused exclusively, I guess, on the notion of user agency and privacy as, as our advocacy tack? Um, or, or more or less, why haven't you just sort of said, this is our value, this is what we bring to the table, rather than you're saying, well, we're still scrambling to see where we should be, and I'm saying there's a certain part of me that thinks you're there now and just run with it. Uh, because... Um, well, as much as we would like to believe that user privacy and user trust are defining market indicators for that, they are the people who make active decisions based on those things to the exclusion of all the other functionality is a lot lower than you would think. Um, it's, it's not sad, it's a trade-off, right? And one of the challenges, that one of the hard things about looking at software is that normal humans cannot look at software and understand how it is operating and what trade-offs we are actually making. Right? Most of the trade-offs that you are making with your privacy in software are quite opaque and often hidden. Right? And so you can't like, even if you're a rational, even if you consider yourself a rational actor, um, you can't look and clearly understand what it is that you're trading off. Right? There's no way to look under the hood and make that. So people generally speaking, also make decisions based on a lot of, based on like the, the actual experience of using the product. For a long time, because the experience of using the product was, uh, was janky, like we frankly did not have a great product two years ago, um, and also because we are in a competitive environment where the people who we are all, most of the people we're making web browsers right now, uh, there are Depending on how you count, there are, let's see. So at the very least, two of our major competitors have marketing budgets of essentially infinity dollars, right? Um, that's one of the challenges we have, right? Uh, they are getting their products installed by default. Uh, and for a long time there, um, for a long time, whenever you were talking, whenever you were using a competitor's product, right, you would go to the services tied to that product. Like if you go to, if you go to Apple's site um, or try to find my iPhone in Firefox, um, you'll get a reminder there. There's like a Safari looking logo there. I don't think they're quite that as blunt about it as uh, Google was for a long time, where if you went to one of Google's services, it would say just come use a faster browser. Right? And their, their claim that it was faster was the value prop that they were giving you in that moment. And if you were looking at kind of a slow, kind of a janky website, 
um, or a slow janky in a slow janky browser, um, that looked like a fairly compelling value proposition at the time. Right? This the challenge we have here is not only about like expressing our values clearly. What we need to do is adhere to our values and hew to them while offering people a compelling experience, even if those are you know even if our values aren't necessarily lined up with what you like. Some some people choose Firefox because it just happens to be their favorite color. Like that's the bright orange logo on the in the taskbar. Right? Some people like that. It's easy to find. Um, other people like Firefox because we have cute mascots. Right? Um, because we have cute mascots. Um, right? Uh, all of these things like we can't just do one thing. Right? Um, we have tried that. Like we've had the Mozilla Manifesto forever. We've had our commitments to privacy forever. Um, since the dawn of the organization. And that has gotten us to where we are now. That's not going to keep us afloat. Right? It's not going to be enough. It's important. It's critically important to any decision that we make. Right? But it can't be the only thing we do. Right? We need to do a lot more than that in order to continue to stay relevant as an organization. Um, this is why we're building, like, I would love for us to, I would love for that to be the decisive thing. Right. If the difference, if that was all that mattered, um, the world would look very different right now. Um, but most people are willing to make trade-offs around their data. Most people are willing to trade something like information and give up information in exchange for some sort of experience. Um, and that's understandable. Like that's a rational action because it turns out it's really, really difficult to give a human being a meaningful experience if you don't know anything at all about them. Right. If you don't know anything about somebody, it's hard to interact and relate to that person, right? And that's true at scale in web services as much as it is uh, for making web browsers. Um, so we want to make sure that you have the option of like going completely dark. Like that's got to be an option that we have. Understanding the data that you're sending out and not sending out, all those telemetry options are visible in preferences. That's very important to us that you still have that agency over what information you send out and what information you don't. That can't be the only thing we do, right? Because that's not going to be enough. Um, are there any other uh, questions in a show of hands there? Yes, please. I found it especially interesting here, comments about the matter of predicting bugs by organizational yeah. distance. And I guess... It residing in the open source community, there's yeah. something surprising there that it, a facile reading of that would say, hey, we've got people contributing to projects from all kinds of different places, therefore they are organizationally distant from one another, therefore we should have much worse bug problems than average. That doesn't seem to be quite right, so there, there must be something more to that principle. It's quite possible. Um, the book, and let me see if I can just look this up. The um, uh, book that's worth looking at is uh, called The Architecture of Open Source Applications. Or, um, let me see. Set of papers? Let me just see if I can look up the, um, the book here. Uh, there is a, okay, I'm just going to look Greg Wilson. Uh, it was co-edited by Greg Wilson. And let me see. Ah, here we go. Um, the book is called Making Software, What Really Works and Why We Believe It. There is a, uh, it's a whole thing is, worth reading. It's apparently very poorly rated on Amazon because it's really very thick and heavy. Well, who's, who gave it one star? <laughs> All right, thank you, helpful helpful Amazon reviewer. Um, it's a great set of publications around actual research, uh, like research-driven knowledge about what makes effective open source uh, project design. There's a lot in there, um, and it's quite a tome. Like it should, It's one of those things where it's going to take you a while to digest and figure out how to internalize a lot of it, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, I happen to know Greg, uh, so, you know, uh, a bit of a plug, but a bit of a conflict of interest there, I guess. But it is a good book, and that paper is in it. Um, uh, as for 
as for why open source is better than closed source in terms of bug counts, um, Eric Raymond once said that uh, many eyes make bugs shallow, right? It's an old quote um, from, I think, the Cathedral in the Bazaar. Uh, it turns out that almost everything that Eric Raymond has said on the subject of software design has been verified to be empirically false. Um, <laughs> uh, and so nothing he says should be trusted. Uh, and the cathedral in the bazaar, in fact, has aged particularly badly, um, as I would argue has he himself. Um, but uh, but there is uh, like this idea that, for example, the idea that many eyes make bug shallow, it turns out we can tell exactly how many eyes. We can measure how many eyes make bug shallow. And the answer is about seven, right? Somewhere between three and four people looking at a code base um, is where you get diminishing returns. Like after four people have reviewed a piece of code, it is very unlikely that the fifth person will catch a bug after that, right? Um, and that is for and that is for domain specific eyes looking at domain specific code, right? Measuring in the abstract, uh, measured like a random human being looking at random uh, chunk of open source code, it's actually quite unlikely that after the second or third person looking at a chunk of code that they'll be able to spot a mistake uh, or discover a new bug. Um, so, yeah, the fact that code is visible, uh, open source code is visible, um, has made participating in code development more accessible, and that is very important. Um, but the idea that there's something magical about open source development is not necessarily the case. Um, like, oh, I, as much as, as important as I think it is, it's, it's not pixie dust, right? Seriously though, don't go reread the Cathedral in the Bazaar. Don't do, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> like, His next book. No. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um. I, I've got a whole set of feelings there that we're gonna not go into. Um, please. Uh, I can get you to talk a little bit more about the the horrible state of uh, advertising. I'm personal to it, but I very much noticed within the business when we're paying for credit card processing mm -hmm. in the U.S. Uh, versus Europe, mm -hmm. they're about five or six to one in price. <coughs> and as far as we can tell, much of that is fraud. There is some fraud in Europe, but it's got to be at least five times greater in the U.S. and Canada. Are you seeing something of the same effect? Uh, so I am, like I said, I'm, I'm peripheral to a lot of these discussions. Um, one of the... Uh, the interesting challenges that has been presented to us uh, recently is European data regulations. But there has been, like, there is such a radically different perspective between Europe and North America with regards to personal information, with regards to how people, and credit card fraud here in North America because data handling is such a very, is a, such a very different experience. That almost necessarily lends itself to the kind of problem uh, you're describing. The, um, as far as advertising fraud, like click-through fraud and a whole bunch of other things like that's concerned. Um, a lot of that is, like, a lot of that is automation. Um, and a lot of that is not necessarily regionally located, so I don't really know the details of this. Um, but, uh, but it's clear, like, all I can say to that subject in some detail is that it's clearly not going to last very long. Like, it's clearly not sustainable and yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a little I don't know if I can, and the, the nature of this, unfortunately, is escape. I wonder if I still have an old. Oh, I'm done. I'm not connected here. Um, there's a fantastic slide that I would like to that I'll see if I can fish up for you, of, of a, a chart of the ad industry circa 2013 and so on. And it is metrics and resellers and metrics and resellers, right? And it is just this wall-to-wall -wall group of dozens and dozens and dozens. There's maybe 200 company logos on this page, all of which are offering to measure something for somebody else on that page for some reason. Um, and there's no, like... There's, 
And it's amazing to see an entire, like, entire wall full of company names that are utterly divorced from a human purchasing something they want, right? Uh, and it's just quantitative, it's just this enormous churn of quantitative metrics on. And in, the, in that environment, uh, this is the reason Facebook and Google now completely dominate that space, right? And all of these other companies are slowly starting to get squeezed out. Um, and even at Google and Facebook scale, they're still suffering from these problems. Like even with the analytics tools that they're able to bring to bear, it's a pervasive problem for them to be able to figure out what an honest transaction looks like from one end to the other. Um, like so much so that a lot of our decisions right now around how to track user, like there's been a sea change in how people talk about tracking protection uh, just in the last couple of weeks as most of the major browsers are starting to say, okay, you know what? This is bullshit. <laughs> this, is, this is terrible and this has to stop. So Apple, I believe, is rolling out tracking protection now. Facebook, uh, don't quote me on this, but Facebook is starting to move to first, first party only cookie support and not third party cookies uh, to get rid of user tracking on that front. Um, we've got some initiatives in the work as well and we've got tracking protection that is on by default in a number of our products as well. Um, we're also looking speculatively at starting to block bad actors just for performance reasons. Um, one of the great, we did a huge uh, study on tracking, like tracking blockers. So do we, turns out, if we turn on all of this tracking blocker stuff, does this actually break the web for anybody? Um, and it turns out that almost all of these trackers are such a miserable experience that people who had it all turned on preferred it. Yes. So like, oh, oh okay. Um, I'm in the yeah. Industry, yeah. And I, I, run, I, run, I don't run a web block, right. I run a tracking block. Right. Uh, okay, this is an open ended question. I have this theory in my mind that there's yeah. more, more than one copy of it. I used to have all sorts of user IDs. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the one for, for gaming was Orville Torpid. Okay. And if you track Orville, you will find useful information about the new gaming. That will allow you to serve me an ad that I actually would like to see. Mm -hmm. And I probably should have a few more different aliases. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, we used to all have nicknames and, and, and yep. short names and so on and so forth. I'm wondering if that aligns with the kind of tracking protection that you're talking about, where one can silo the suppliers and advertisers say, yes, I'm definitely interested in knowing about Subaru accessories because I just bought a Subaru. Don't send me an ad for a Ford. One of the challenges um, we have in this idea of informed consent um, has long been the question of actual, like there are fundamental philosophical questions in there about identity. Yeah. Um, and these are questions that we all kind of struggle with, like the questions we have day to day. Are you the same person uh, hanging out with your friends on the weekends as you are when you're at work? Maybe, maybe not, right? I would hope not. Um, do you have the same, like are you the same person? In a sense you are and in a sense you're not, right? You are making informed choices about what information you radiate to who. Um, we have long struggled with the idea. We like, we've built containerized, like the Facebook container is a thing that we, uh, we built in recently, um, and one of the things that you can do with a Facebook container is, you know, not be Facebook me yeah. when I'm other places, yeah. right? You, there can be Facebook me, and then there can be other me, and we can build ways now to do that with other things. It's not an idea that gets huge uptake. Um, it's in the people to whom it is important. It is like a lot of the features we have in Firefox. The people who care about it at all care about it a lot, right? Um, but a lot of people don't realize. That 80-20 rule, it turns out it's a different 20% for everyone, right? Um, which, uh, which frankly sucks when you're trying to make decisions, um, but it also means, um, on the side, yeah, cute animals. Um, I'm gonna close this up, but um, one of my friend, my friend Martel, who is one of these people who is just unreasonably talented, um, this is actually, it says he got lost on the way to Albuquerque. That's an actual old Bugs Bunny reference in here. And that is an actual map of Albuquerque in there, written in various forms. Because the old Bugs Bunny, I got, took a left turn on the way to Albuquerque, right? 
All right. Anyway, that's enough of that. Um, uh, let's go. That, ca that character holding the map, that is a map of Albuquerque. Um, uh, yeah, like I have long valued the idea of identity as being very, like, almost fractal in a lot of ways. Um, I think that it is an important idea. Um, I think that on a personal note, um, and this isn't company policy, but when people talk about identities and the blockchain, like, I stop listening right away because... You know, I think blockchain in general is just a disaster um, for a lot of different reasons. But um, are we having are we having some laughs? <laughs> are we, no, have I crossed the line here? Is anyone here? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say we can really. <sighs> um, the polite way of saying what I think about it is that a blockchain, Bitcoin is a very effective way of turning crypto libertarian daydreams directly into climate change. Um, <laughs> I have, I have harsher ways to, I have heart, I've written down the harsher way I have of saying that, which I'm not going to mention on the camera. Uh, but the, uh, but just in general, I think that these solid, these like unitary or unified notions of identity are very naive. Um, and uh, I think that a lot of people's freedom of choice and freedom of self-expression comes down to a lot of degrees of nuance around degrees of nuance of anonymity, degrees of nuance of identity, uh, the chance to be a new person in a new moment, um, I think is important for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is that maybe someone is holding out hopes that you can be a better person. Right, um, and that you can do something new with yourself, something that's worthwhile. Um, you know, do, is, am I the same person that I was at the tail end of high school? Kind of. Jesus, I hope not. Um, you know, I kind of am, and I kind of hope I'm never that again. Um, so yeah, I think that we haven't done a great job as a computer industry of understanding that we force people, generally speaking, to you know, just log out of everything and log back in as that other person. Um, and we don't have easy ways of doing that. Um, to some extent, private browsing helps that. To some extent, containers help that. Um, browser profiles is something that are kind of on the way out because they've been, an uh, been a, a headache for us internally as far as the code architecture goes. Um, it's a space where the world could do a lot better. Um, and so, yeah, um, I think that uh, I think that there's a lot of a lot of space left to explore. I mean, people should have a chance to try out new things and to try maybe to be new people. I mean, I've got kids growing up right now. I've got one. Uh, my daughter is nine years old. I'm nine years old, going on seventeen, yep. right? And um, and you can tell that she's getting into this space where she's about to become a teenager. And teenagers try a lot of faces on before they pick the one they're mostly going to settle with. Right? And I think that that's an important formative process. But I also think that we can do better as an internet. We can do better as a society um, if more people have the chance to have that kind of freedom and safety to sort of explore. Um, some people are going to do stupid, reprehensible things with that because people are people and there's a couple of stupid, reprehensible decisions in all of us. Um, but I think that it's important that we have that freedom. Um, and I don't know what that means or what that looks like, but I do hope that Mozilla actually plays a role in building an internet where that's still possible. Right? Like I would hate to have to live my entire life with just what I've done on my one account and that's it and I'm committed to that history forever. That would kind of suck. Um, and like I am a boring dude. Like it would suck for me and I am a middle class white dude with two kids and a mortgage, right? And a pretty vanilla, t in a, like, and frankly, vanilla kinks and um, uninteresting hobbies, right? Like, people who want to explore and do more interesting things um, should not be constrained to the list of what is possible just for me, right? That future would suck. Um, yeah, sorry, you go ahead. You're leaning into the mic. Yeah, so. Um, Second last or last? Okay. Uh, so, I, I've been using Firefox for a long time of the privacy. Uh, when Quantum came out, I was uh, happy because I did notice uh, speed increases dramatically. Um, we use uh, Google Apps at work. Uh, and I find that I find that with Quantum, uh, 
I think it's Google slowing, trying to slow it down. Uh, have you guys noticed that? Even with YouTube, uh, and I've looked up stuff on the internet, and there's you know sort of a you know they blame they, they blame Google, and I, I kind of wanted to take or to know your guys' take on it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we have uh, a variety of exciting feelings about that, both uh, official and unofficial. Um, officially, uh, one of the realities of the situation is that developers at Google develop for Chrome. Um, and it's not a question of them doing things deliberately to slow us down. It's that in terms of design and deployment and rolling it out, uh, they develop for Chrome uh, exclusively, uh, or almost exclusively. And a lot, of their, um, a lot of their work treats other browsers kind of as an afterthought. We're, like Firefox is not the only people who are afflicted with this. We also have like Safari has, I expect, these same conversations uh, with Google now and then, um, where they will choose to use like a Polymer layer. They'll choose to use an, uh, an interface layer for JavaScript or something like that uh, that happens to be very performant in Chrome uh, or that happens to offer them certain advantages in Chrome that for one reason or another are underperformant in other browsers. Uh, Safari, um, Safari gets... Uh, I don't know, cheating a little bit is the right thing, but uh, just by virtue of being underpinned by WebKit, uh, I think that Safari gets uh, has a couple of advantages there in terms of their ability to keep up. Um, it would be uh, delightful if um, the teams around Google would prioritize making like web pages as opposed to you know Chrome first pages. Um, but it is given their position, which is a dominant market position, and given Chrome's like the, the fact that they have a Chrome team in-house working for them, um, I can understand why that happens. Uh, this is not to put the blame on the Chrome team, uh, to be clear. We have our disagreements about a number of things, but the Chrome team believes in the web as well, right? Um, and we, all of us want the web to be fast, performance standards compliant, and interoperable. Um, that doesn't mean that it rises to the level of a design priority for various different teams inside uh, Google at various times. Um, like various features eventually find their way to Firefox, if not getting built on them directly. That is uh, that is the nature of that beast, uh, unfortunately. Um, and in an organization the size of Google, which has I don't know how many people work at Google now, eighty thousand, a hundred thousand people, um, like affecting meaningful cultural change within an organization that size is really, really hard and really, really slow. Um, and so while the Chrome team like is a partner of is a partner with Firefox in evangelizing the web and evangelizing open standards, um, it doesn't look like the incentives within Google as an organization lean towards that. Um, they tend to lean towards Chrome first development. Um, and it's not unique to them. Like a lot of shops unfortunately do. It's uh, the challenge of having a market share where we do, which is you know, not a nothing, but it's a fraction of what it was. Um, depending on who's measuring it, we're hovering around 12 to 15% now, a little bit shy of that, actually. And um, so, yeah, uh, it's understandable. We don't like it, um, but, you know, and we try to react to it when we do by pushing out updates um, to our side of the client to make sure that it's, our stuff works with it. Uh, we live and die in nightly. Uh, as developers, we try to make sure that all of our changes and this stuff get uh, pushed into nightlies and tested with Google stuff because we like we use Google Docs as well. Like we also, in addition to in addition to um, building a competing product, we also work with Google's enterprise apps because we happen to find GDocs super useful um, and a bunch of other things like that. So we test this stuff and we live with it every day. Uh, and sometimes that works great, and sometimes it uh, bogs down a little bit. Um, yeah, other, I have other different feelings, but not today. Um, uh, sorry, the that was the second last question. We got a flag. We got time for one more because we're like creeping up to nine o'clock here, and I don't want to. Oh, we got one. Um, maybe not a short question, but you can comment. Fantastic. Anyway, way. Um, it's it's often hard for people who aren't 
programmers to understand how software works. Partly, I think you get that in any specialized field. And partly, mm -hmm. it's more opaque than a lot of things. Um, but as specifically, he mentioned, um, <laughs> you were very disappointed that privacy wasn't more important to more people. But not everybody thinks about this as much as as a lot of people you find at a Linux user group would. Um, and I just wonder, it's, it's almost more of a user experience, user interface and education problem in terms of how do you, and I'm rambling a bit, but like I talk to people who would say, um, well, I have nothing to hide. Why should I be worried about it? But yet, as you say, we are different people in different situations. Oh. And these same people would subconsciously in sort of the real world, yeah display different, I mean, they know well, you don't just tell whoever or whatever about anything, even if it's not really a secret, but how, how, how do people learn and are able, how to translate that onto the internet so that sort of normal people can? I might, when I hear people say that they have nothing to hide, um, like, first of all, I don't believe you. Um, to be clear, um, people say that uh, out of a sense of, like people say they have nothing to hide. None of us, you don't have anything to hide when you close the door in the bathroom, when you go to the can, right? You don't have anything to hide when, you, when blinds are the first thing you buy in a new house, right? It's not because you have something to hide, it's because the link between privacy and basic human dignity is something we all sort of viscerally understand, right? Computing as a whole is a new space. Like you are all in this GTA lug, not because you have a deep, you know, you're not because you have a deep affection for the internals of the Linux kernel probably, but probably because you actually want to have some agency over your computing environment. Like you want to have agency over how the tools around you work, right? Maybe have a voice in how they change and, and how they work. Um, maybe you just like the idea of being having like having more choices or understanding what your choices are. When it comes to user privacy and user data, I think that the two things that are unavoidable in this conversation is telling people that no, these are things like this is a part of your dignity as an individual is to be able to decide what other people see of you, right? To be able to decide what you show and what you don't, right? To be able to decide what you tell people and what you don't tell people. For some people who live relatively comfortable existences, right, that's not a big deal, right? Telling someone uh, that you are Jewish is, is that a big deal? That depends on the context, right? Telling someone online that you have a certain ethnic background, that you have a certain amount of money, right? That you have a certain, that you live in a certain area, right? For some people, that's not a big deal. For other people, being asked to say, okay, asking them to work in the open, asking them to share personal information is not substantially different than asking them to walk home at night alone, right? We all have really, really different risk assessments when we're talking about the information we give up and what we surrender working online. And if there's one thing we've learned in the last couple of years is that that means that some individuals can get targeted. Right? And those risks extend, those risks factors look very, very different for people of different backgrounds, of different degrees of privilege, and in different contexts. Right? Um, when we talk about informed choice, what we are really talking about here is you're having agency over that context. Right? You're having a say in the degree of safety that you're going to be allowed. Right? You having a say in the degree of places, you, the safety you can experience, the places you can go, the things you can do. Um, and so, yeah, you might, not, you might not have anything to hide. And that may not matter when the eye of Sauron of the internet turns to face you, right? That may not matter if somebody who hates you hard enough and has 50,000 Twitter followers who can be told they hate you hard enough decides today's your day, right? Um, and so that is I mean, that kind of perspective on user choice and user freedom around the data you emit, around how you can protect yourself. Uh, has a lot to do with your degree of freedom and agency at all, 
like you, we can't. One of the things, one of the reasons that we keep beating the drum around uh, around inclusivity at Mozilla, the organization, one of the reasons we keep beating the drum about uh, codes of conduct and why they matter is that people cannot be equal participants in an environment where they have unequal agency, in an environment where they feel unequally threatened or unequally at risk. Right? Um, and your privacy and your dignity are an unavoidable and inextricable part of that conversation. Right? So that's how we talk about it. We talk about it as though this is, these are meaningful life choices. Like I remember for real when the internet was a different thing like a separate, you had a life, and then you had this thing over the internet life, right? And they were apart from each other, right? And like the internet was not everywhere and in everything all the time, right? Software wasn't everywhere and in everything. Um, and now it is. The language hasn't really kept up with that. Um, our ability to talk about our own sense of self, like not just identity, but dignity, and mutual respect hasn't kept up. Um, still matters, um, and that's how we talk about it. So that was sort of, you asked a rambly question and you got a rambly answer, I guess, in return. Um, thank you, uh, but um, that kind of thing matters. Thank you.